We're going to go vertical over the next few weeks, and, and uh, if, if it's okay with you, uh, we're going to just slide right in from summer in the Psalms into vertical. Is that okay? That we just, I, I'm tempted just to, to stand up and play a little electric slide, and that's just kind of... Just slide on over, but but uh, it's really interesting. I love how God speaks through um, uh, to a local church and just how He's uh, you know just how ha- what He's speaking to this house and what He's just d- developing in us and helping us grow and and so uh, Amy and I get to get to see that and our team and, and as we plan we get to kind of see that from a. Uh, maybe like a 10,000 mile perspective and where as you sometimes you come in that week or you see a series and a group at a time but I hope you're able to connect hey this is something that the Lord is speaking to the house through my pastors and this is helping lead me to a a, a, a a deeper place uh, in the word, in the Lord, and in, in experiencing with him. And so uh, I, I'm, I'm trusting that you're experiencing that and seeing how things go together. So if you can look in a, in a matter of six months or 12 months, you can go, hey, I am growing in this direction, or this is where the Lord is leading us. And, and over the last few, uh, lo- really through the summer, and what I believe Lord is leading us into this fall is, is a passion, a greater passion for his presence. A greater passion and an understanding, um, because understanding and passion go together. A passion without understanding is just a feeling, and, and that's, that's wonderful. But we want to be able to, to capture this and to really get everything that God has for us. And, and LifeGate, from, the, from day one, has been a presence-driven church. And what that means is, is we show up, and that's important. We have to be present, but, but we need God to show up. Like we, <laughs> I don't, I don't want to preach if God doesn't show up. This team, they don't want to sing if God doesn't show up. We, as a church, we, we don't need to be here if, if God's not here. We can, we can hang out in a lot of different places. There's a lot of different things that we could be doing in our lives. We need to meet with God, with God's people in God's presence. And, and so this, this series is taking us from a summer in the Psalms. And what I ended with last week was, was David's passion for his presence. And, and we just got barely into it. And so I'm going to kind of mesh the end of last week and then this week together. And, and over the next few weeks, we're going to just celebrate going vertical. We're going to make the decision in our hearts to go more vertical than ever before. If we're not careful in our lives, we live in the horizontal realm. And what I mean by that is our relationships with each other. But we, don't, we, we miss sometimes the important fact that the vertical relationship is what sustains the horizontal. My, my marriage, the kids, the, the, the relationships, the interpersonal relationships, the, the work relationships, the, uh, the hobby relationships, whatever those are. Um, and if you're one of those people that don't like people, I'm sorry. There's a lot of people on earth. And guess what? We're here and there's nothing you can do about it, Okay. <laughs> But, but a lot of times we're, we're trying to sustain the relationships with each other by the relationships with each other. And, and, and what happens is if you think about a vertical beam, uh, just think about the, the, the way the cross is modeled. The, the, the vertical beam comes first and it holds the horizontal. If there's no vertical, there's no horizontal, you're trying to float. And sometimes our relationships, we're just trying to float. We're just trying to hold it together. We're trying to do some weird kind of levitation deal, levitating so that we can relate relationally, so that we can be what we need to be in our relationships. And can I just tell you, you can try, let's just practice for just a second. I want you to concentrate as hard as you can. This is not mysticism. This is sarcasm. I want you to try really hard to levitate from that blue chair. Oh, look, there's somebody doing it. You can't. As much as you, and I want you to think about the strain and the frustration sometimes that we have. To, I'm getting some weird looks right now. They're like, this is not the kind of church I was meant to come to. But I want you to think about the pressure and sometimes what the, 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 the squeeze that we feel to sustain us, and to, to sustain our, our lives. And guess what? You were never created to sustain your life. We were created, we came from the brave presence of God. The very breath we breathe, you wouldn't be able to breathe it had God not breathed his breath into you. You wouldn't be who you are, that fine specimen of a man or a woman or, 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 or however old, however tall, including short people. You, wouldn't, you didn't make you, God made you. He forms you with his hands. 
He breathed the very breath of life. And what sustains us in our life isn't that we've got it figured out, isn't that we work harder, isn't any of those things. It is his presence. We are sustained by the very presence of God. And we are headed somewhere. Everybody say, I'm headed somewhere. We're headed to heaven. Did y'all realize at the end of this isn't the end? It's just the beginning of eternity. And guess what makes eternity special and beautiful and what makes heaven heaven? The very presence of God. The very fact that God is there. So there is this longing and this thing inside of us if we'll, if we'll get in touch with it. Even those of you today that go, I don't, I, don't, I don't really get Jesus and I don't really get this relationship with him. Still, even you, we are made in his image and there is this longing inside of us to be in the presence of God. And we may look here and there and go up and down and we will look all around, but every single human being on the earth, they're longing for something and it is the presence of God. That's what we were created to long for. If we're missing anything, it's his presence. Now, does life require hard work? Does it require the relational skills and interpersonal? Yes, all that stuff, but his presence comes first. That's why we're going vertical. Everybody say vertical with me. Vertical. We're going vertical. Three promises of his presence. Again, kind of connecting uh, last week to this week. God's omnipresence. Omni simply means everywhere, all encompassing. God's presence is everywhere. Anybody thankful for that? Yeah, I'm glad his presence is everywhere. But then I'm also thankful for number two promise of his presence is his inner presence. Because of Jesus, he made it possible for God's presence to live inside of me. The Holy Spirit lives in me. And then number three, the manifest presence of God. This is the ministry of Jesus, the, actually, the actual works and the power of Jesus manifested. That means to bring to light or to reveal. It means to actually see it happen. The whole purpose of walking with, of, 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 of having the Holy Spirit living in us is not just that we're going to heaven. He does that. Romans 8 says that he gives us a spirit of adoption. It's a spirit of, hey, that's my father. And I might have a good father on earth or I might have a sorry father, but I came from God. He is my father. He is Abba Daddy. And I have a spirit of adoption. That means I belong to Jesus. That's, that's the Holy Spirit. He does that. He confirms that in me. All right. So beyond that, what does he do? He is here to reproduce the power and the manifestation of Jesus through the believer's life. That means that you and I get to look more like Jesus tomorrow than we did today. The next day, we look more and more like Jesus. I, I want to look, look less and less like Michael, and I want to look more and more like Jesus. I don't know if you guys have come to the realization, but you ain't got it. But Jesus does. You may realize that you're going to come face to face with some things that you just can't cut it, but Jesus can. He is the name above all other names. His name is bigger than grief. His name is bigger than defeat. His name is bigger than your past. His name is bigger than your anger issue. His, na his name is bigger than your financial issue. His name is bigger than this economy or the issues that are out there. And as much as we want to say the issues are out there, we're out there, then we come in here and the issues aren't over there. The issues are in us. And he's bigger than what you deal with and what's going on in you. I am so glad there is a name above all other names. And his name is Jesus. And the spirit of God, the manifest presence of God, is in us to reproduce what that looks like. If you're a teenager, guess what? You walk into school, but guess who else walks into school? Jesus walks into school, the very manifest presence of God. And here's what we're going to connect to this today is, yes, it's like Jesus is there and, and the spirit of Jesus is, is in me because Jesus is in heaven. He's at the right hand of God, but his spirit, his presence is in my life. But there's also this other stuff that's in there still too. And sometimes it feels like they're combating and they're warring with each other. Y'all ever seen Lord of the Rings? There's this guy named Smeagol on there. And we get Smeagolish sometimes. Paul describes this in Ephesians. He says that the spirit of this world and the spirit of God are at war within our hearts. And do you know where they war? They war in the soulish realm. They war in our thoughts. They war in our mind. And what we're talking about, the more space we make for God's presence, he overcomes. That's who he is. That's what he does. And so, so when I'm going through something, what do I want to do? I don't want to just try to get through it. I want to I make space for the presence of God. We, we, we can even build a works program based around God's presence. If you grew up in the Baptist church or maybe the Methodist church, it, it's the 
it's the, and sometimes I'm not saying that that's what we, what we, uh, what we meant to do, but this is what we end up doing. You grew up at LifeGate. You start with a fast song, then you go to a middle song, then you go to the slow song. That's when the Holy Spirit shows up. Until then, you don't let him out. You know what I'm saying? In the Baptist church, it's two hymns and a her. At lunch today, you're going to be sitting there and all of a sudden you're going to go, I get it. But if you have to explain it, it probably wasn't worth saying. But you see what I'm having? We'll, we'll build a formula to get to the presence of God. We'll build a formula to, because, because part of our brokenness is a works mentality. I'll work to get to the presence of God. But I just want to remind you, all this stuff with God, you couldn't work to get to it. That's why he had to come to you. His manifest presence is a gift. Now you get to decide how much space in your life you make for it. And that's what we're going to talk about today. I can be, Amy can be married to me and we can be in covenant with each other, but based on the way we treat each other, we get to decide how many of the vows we're going to fulfill in our relationship. You see what I'm saying? It's funny how you say all these vows of what you're going to do before you're actually married to the person. I'm going to do this. I'm going to be this. I'm going to do this. You are this to me. And then you got the rest, the rest of the 50 years, the rest of your life to get to do everything that you just said you're going to do. Sadly, so many people, you come up to things and it's like, uh-uh, not going to be able to do that one. But in our relationship with God, there is, and here, here's, here's what's so great about this. He is the strong side of our relationship. Between me and him, he's the one who always keeps his word. He always tells the truth. He always is faithful. When I'm not faithful, he's faithful. Come on, anybody seen that, experienced that in your life? You wake up, you have all these, God, I'm going to be faithful, and then you're not. But he's faithful. And he comes back and he promises not just my presence is everywhere, not just the inner presence that, 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 that I know he's there and I'm experiencing him in, inside of me, that I'm a carrier of his presence, but, but not just that, that I see his power manifest. Some of you today, you need to see God's power manifest in a situation. You need to see something happen. You need to see, hey, I, I, I have confidence in this and that, and I'm looking at ways to do. Listen, you can't just stop and just go, well, I'm just trusting in God's presence. I'm not going to do anything. No, we're going to make space for his presence. We're going to be intentional about it, but you need God to show up. You need God to do something. They were in a similar place in the book of Isaiah, and this scripture is going to kind of be an umbrella over vertical, but Isaiah 64, 1, Isaiah says, oh, that you would rend the heavens, that you would come down, everybody say down, that the mountains might shake at your presence. Oh, that you would rend the heavens. To rend means to, I want you to picture God in, in, the, in, in the sky, and, and he's looking down, and, and, and Isaiah is saying, oh, that you would rend the heavens, that God would stretch and, and just split the sky open, and that he would come down and be with his people, and that all oh, the mountains would shake, not because God is everywhere, but because God is here. I don't need God over there. I need God right here. I don't need to just learn about God. I need to experience God. Have you come to that place in your life? Have you come to that place? Have you faced something in your life that, that, that it just seems huge and you don't need to just face it? You need to face God. You need to be in his presence. You need to hear from him. You need to hear a word from the Lord. You don't need something from yesterday or in the past. You need something today, a word from God, because he's in the room and you're meeting with him face to face. That's what Isaiah is saying. God, that you would rend the heavens and that you would come down here. What I believe is there are many in the body of Christ who are saved enough to go to heaven but not in a relationship with the Holy Spirit enough to cry out to God, God, rend the heavens and come visit with us. They're okay with the long distance relationship. But you don't have to be that way. You don't have to have that. You can have intimacy. You can have a relationship with him in such a way that, that I believe that you can one day ask God to rend the heavens and visit with you, but then the next day just to want it again. 
and the next day to want it again, and the next day to want it again because you just can't get enough of him. There's, there's something else about God that you want to experience and, and live in his presence, this, his manifest presence. It's what Isaiah is crying out. And I want you to think about what, what he talks about. He says the mountains. Isn't it interesting that he says the mountains will tremble, the mountains will shake. I want you to think back to the last time you went to the mountains. Maybe not just the last time, but the first time you went to the mountains. Pulling up. Well, I don't know what the mountains look like for you. They're a little bit different in the west than they are here. They kind of roll here. Out west, they go straight up. But I remember as a kid loading up, we're headed to the mountains. All of a sudden, you look out, and, and, and remember, this is what we do. I remember the first time we were in Alaska, and we flew in. The plane drops in, not drops, but lands. We're still here. Right, John? We're here. The plane lands, and there's all these clouds. You, you, everybody was talking about everybody that had been there before. We're like, man, the mountains are glorious here. I'm like, whatever. There are no mountains. They say they're out there, but they're not. But then there was this day, the last day of the trip. We were there 10 days. The last day of the trip, the clouds part, and all of a sudden, there are these giant peaks. They are huge. They're glorious. And I just want to say... The Blue Ridge Mountains are a little bit different than the Rocky Mountains. <laughs> and the ranges in Alaska. And, and all of a sudden there were these mountains and it looks and it goes, oh my goodness, they're just, they're glorious and they're beautiful. And, and I just think, wow, this is, this is a really special place. There's just something about the mountains. Let's just land the plane right here and just head on out. Why don't we just go to the mountains? Anybody okay with that? You don't need to go to school this week or work. Let's just go to the mountains. And there's just something about when we pull into the, my, my, uh, my language changes when we pull into the mountains. The way I talk changes. Every time we pull into the Smoky Mountains, I ask the family, do you know why they call them the Smoky Mountains? And because there's smoke, you know. And it goes a little country, not Villarica country, like way country. And in the whole, the whole experience, but here, so, so are you there with me? Anybody with me? You, you're picturing that, that moment that you've been there. And, and then I want you to see, have you ever, ever, ever seen that mountain move? Sometimes I wish they would move because have you ever noticed that you want to go to a restaurant or maybe a trout stream on the other side of the river and it's literally, it's literally 500 yards away, but it takes you 20 minutes to get there because you've got to go around it. You've got, to tra- you've got to change your time. You've got to change because you've got to go around it because the mountain won't just move. If you could go through it, if you could go over it, or if the mountain moved. And Isaiah says, God, would you rend the heavens and would you come down and would you move this mountain? Would you, would you allow the very mountains? And, and what is he saying? This is, this is a euphemism for everything in our lives that you can't move. He says, you can't move it, but God can. I need God to rend the heavens. Is anybody at church today that needs God to rend the heavens and that he would come down in the mountains in my life, the things that I can't move, he would move. Because that's what he does. He steps into your life and he does what you can't do. And we need to meet with a God that would come and rend the heavens and move what we can't move. It wasn't just Isaiah. Jesus thought this too. He says, have faith. Say to this mountain, get on up out of my way. And can I just tell you, a lot of times, yes, I can. A lot of times we are diverting and making turns and going around roundabouts and we are making arrangements in our Christian life around mountains that ought to be moved. And when we make a place for the presence of God, we will live the life that he intended, not one that is, that is trying to make detours around mountains and it's taking you 10 times as long to get where he wants you to go. And it's not because God doesn't want you there and it's not because it's not close, it's because there is a mountain in the way and you need God's presence to show up to get it out. If you ever ask the question, why do I keep coming back to this place? 
And it's because that place is on the journey to get to where you need to go, but there's a mountain in the way, and you don't need to go up, and you don't need to go through. You need to just make a place for God's presence because when he rends the heaven and shows up, mountains disappear. Mountains move. And the church... The local church needs to be a place where the world can come, where God does what they can't find anywhere else. And if we build places where they can just come and get taught good things, their kids can be kept in nursery so that it gives parents a few times in church, a few minutes without the kids. Nothing wrong with that. I think it's secondary and I think it's good. Praise God for kids' ministry. But there's more that's happening here than just a break on Sunday morning. The microphone just did something awesome. Did you hear that? Huh? No, kids' ministry isn't secondary. The fact that you get a space with your kids not sitting next to you and going, Mama, Daddy, and I need this and I need that, that is a, can we just say praise God from a parent who has toddlers? That's, that's nice. First is that you get to be in the presence of God. Second is you get a little break too. But there's more that's happening here. This is It's okay if we huddle on Sunday mornings, if something comes out of the huddle. Tony Evans says it like this. We don't mind to look at the huddle on a ball field or a a football field and and, and see all the behinds of the football players huddled up. As long as when they come out of that huddle, they do something. And here's what happens. The church was never called to gather just to huddle and not show anything for it. We get to be a window into heaven. We get to be a window of here's where he rends the heavens and he comes down and he shakes the mountains. That's what the presence of God does. That's what his presence does in our life. And again, we don't work for it. We just simply acknowledge it and make a place for his presence, for him to come. And, 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 then, and then I want to end with this part, not in the message, don't get any ideas. But, but in the beginning of this, he says, oh, And this isn't like, oh, this is, oh, that you would rend the heavens, not, oh, rend the heavens if you're feeling like it. It's, oh, rend the heavens. And it's not a whine. It's not a, it's not a begging in that way. It's an exclamation that, oh, that you would rend the heavens and do this. It's this, this life that my life is an exclamation that I need God to show up, that I need God to do something. Oh, that I would meet with him. Not a whining, not a desperation in the sense that it can't be met because there is that, there is a fatalism of, of almost, oh, I just, and, and, it's, and it's not that. This is an exclamation It's an unshakable sense that without him, his manifest presence, without it, I'm lost. Without his presence, I'm lost. Without God's manifest presence, we are completely, utterly, and entirely lost. I'm going to say it again. Without God's manifest presence, we are completely, utterly, and entirely lost. A.W. Tozer says this, complacency is a deadly foe of all spiritual growth. Acute desire must be present or there will be no manifestation of Christ to his people. He waits to be wanted. Look at this. God waits to be wanted by you. Too bad that with many of us, he waits so long, so very long in vain. But not us. Not here. Not in my marriage. Not in my house. Come on, somebody. Not in my relationship. No, we're, we're going to be with Isaiah crying out, oh, God, rend the heavens. Oh, God, show up and do what only you can do. God, would you manifest your presence here? Would you manifest your power here? So living vertical, check this out. Full swing, 2 Corinthians 3, 16 through 18. Remember I said you couldn't work it up. This isn't something you do on your own strength. This was a gift from God that, that God himself, through Jesus, made available for us. He says, but the moment anyone turns to the Lord, anybody in the house ever turned to the Lord? Well, here's what happens. It says, when you turn to the Lord, the veil or the separation is lifted and they see. So I want you to see what happens. See what happens. The mountain is in your way, but then you make a place for God's presence when you turn to the Lord. A lot of us are turning to the mountain. You need to turn to the Lord. 
Turn to the Lord. When you turn to the Lord, the veil is removed, the mountain disappears, and you're able to see clearly where you're supposed to be going. Told you it was going to make sense. It says the veil is lifted and they see, now the Lord I'm referring to is the Holy Spirit. Everybody say Holy Spirit. And wherever he is Lord, what does that mean to be Lord? That means he's in charge. That means he comes first. That means he, he has the, uh, the ultimate authority. When he's in charge, when he's Lord, there is freedom. We can all draw close to him with the veil removed from our faces and, no, and, and with no veil, we can become like mirrors who brightly reflect the glory of the Lord Jesus. We are being transfigured into his very image as we move from one brighter level of glory to another. And this glorious transfiguration comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is the manifest presence of God on the earth today. I just showed you that. So fellowship with him, relationship with the Holy Spirit. We can't just have God as father. We can't have Jesus as the big brother, just Jesus as the big brother. We have to have relationship and interaction with the Holy Spirit. And so we talked about this last week. David treasured the presence of God. David made a place for the presence of God. He was a king in the Old Testament, and he was God's representative, not just to be king, but to be the, the bringer or the, the one who would prioritize the, the, the God's presence. I wonder who in your realm of influence is going to be the, the one God appoints to be the one who makes a place for God's presence. Because in David's story, it was him, but in your story, it's you. God's looking for somebody in your house, in your business, in your volunteer program, in your school, in your realm of influence to make a place to say, I'm going to treasure God's presence. I'm going to treasure his manifest presence. Moses had this really cool relationship with God. He was the, the, the one who led Israel out of, of slavery in Egypt. And we're going to look at his story over the next few weeks. But, but one of these re, this remarkable conversations that, that Moses had with the Lord, it inspires us to be ones who treasure God's presence. And, and God actually said, Moses, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send you with my blessing. I'm going to send you with my omnipresence, but my manifest presence isn't going with you. Because it took a lot for Moses to prioritize God's presence. They built a place where he would live and, and they would actually move that temple or they, not te uh, temple, but that tabernacle, they would move it around so that there could be this orderly worship that would take place. And, and so there was a lot of work that went into that. I would encourage you to look at, at the instruction in the Old Testament in Exodus about how God says, hey, you make a place for my presence. So Moses did that, but then God said, guys, I'm, I'm going to head on out w without you. you, you th th these people are crazy. And there you go. Anytime you need to just say that clear statement, people are crazy, God said it too. Let's just say that. People are crazy. And sometimes they get cray-cray, and guess what? You is one of those people too, and you get cray-cray. And, and when you say it about somebody else, somebody else is saying it about you, and I'm not saying you should gossip, but we should just all admit the fact that all of us without God can go a little crazy. And, and so God had, had just said, hey, Moses, you can go, and I'm going to bless you, and your, my presence is going to go. And, and watch how Moses, uh, their interaction. This is verse 14 of Exodus 33. God said, this is the message paraphrase. I love the kind of the tongue-in-cheek, the way it's worded. Check this out. He said, God said, my presence will go with you. I'll see the journey to the end. And Moses said, if your presence doesn't take the lead here, call this trip off right now. How else will we be known that you're with me in this? With me and with your people, are you traveling with us or not? How else will we know how will we know that we are special and I, your people, among all other people on this planet Earth? Look at this. His presence is what is, is the special. His presence is the special. His manifest presence, not just God over there, but God right here. That's what is, is special about us. That's what makes us uh, uh, something special is it's, it's his presence on us. We're not, we're not good enough on our own. We're, we're not glorious enough on our own. We need his glory in his presence. And it doesn't matter how long you've been serving God, we all circle back to this some way or another. It all comes back to are we special on our own or do we need God's presence to stand out? So this relationship, 
is reciprocated. God wanted this with Moses. Moses wanted this with God. And then we see David model this. We're going to come back to Moses next week. But we see David model this, and he brings the presence of the Lord to Israel, and, and they begin to worship there. And listen, that, that ruffles some feathers. People didn't get it. People didn't understand it. But he treasured God's presence. Most of the Psalms that David wrote were written out of this intimacy in this place in the presence of God. He led Israel to look to the presence of God, to go vertical first, then everything else would find its place. What followed this is, is a lot of years of blessing and favor. Man, they won whoever they fought against. They saw miraculous things happen in the physical, the emotional, and the spiritual because they, they made a place for God's presence. I just declare that over your life right now. Today, as you make a switch and you begin to go vertical and treasure God's presence, that you see breakthrough that you hadn't seen before. You see, you see mountains disappear that, that were there and that have been standing in their way, and you recognize the bigness of God. Oh, that God would rend the heavens in your life, that he would come down and the mountains would tremble because we treasure his presence. And number two, we see that David modeled guarding God's presence. Everybody say guard. Guard God's presence. And you say, who do we need to guard it against? Because it's a gift that he made available to us. And, and one of the greatest places that we need to guard it from us is us. Because there's things in us until we get to heaven that will come and take, a, take the place of the presence of God. And we talked about this last week. It's not God's presence goes, ah! Scared of Michael? No, no, no. It's just that we just, ego, edging God out. We move, just nudging, and we move God out of the situation. One of the ways that, the main ways that we allow God the authority and the place to do whatever he wants is we, we look to him first. We go vertical. We have a life of worship. And it's a lifestyle of worship that will protect. It's a lifestyle of worship that guards the presence of God in our lives and it keeps us vertical. David assigned, check this out. Some of you history people, you're going to love this. David, in, in, so, so here's the, the presence of God in this place of worship in, the, uh, in David's town. And remember last week, David just pitched a tent, had a place for God's presence. And check, check what he, he put in front of this place of worship. He assigned 288 singers, 24 worship teams, 12 members of each to pray and worship 24-7 in front of the presence of God. What were they there to do? They weren't there with swords. They weren't there with ARs. They weren't there with fists and muscle. And they weren't there with, as guards in that way. How did they guard the presence of God? They worshiped. How did they keep the presence of God? They worshiped. They made a place for God. Did, did it mean they didn't have circumstances in their life? Of course not. Everybody has circumstances. Does it mean they didn't have dysfunctional people in their life? No, some of them were dysfunctional. But when they got to the presence of God, they went vertical. Before horizontal, they guarded the presence of God by what? By worship. And who can worship? Everybody. 244 people. Do you know that by the time they moved the presence of God to Solomon's temple, fast forwarding later on, there were 4,000 people who it was their full-time job and their position to simply stand before the glory of God and worship. Worship is the most powerful thing you can do in your life. It's what you were created for, and it guards and protects the manifest presence of God in our life. And the reason sometimes, guys, that we stand before a mountain and are going, oh, big mountain, is because we stopped saying, oh, God. Because we became worshipers of the mountain instead of worshiping of the God who can move the mountain. Our job is not to call out how big the mountain is. Our God, our job is to call out how big our God is. And not because he's on an ego trip. Because you and everybody else on this planet needs to know how big your God is. And you're going to face circumstances. You're going to face some situations. But before and beyond facing all that, you come face to face with God. Some of you are facing some things that, I, that, that we would struggle to comprehend. Maybe you've never told anybody. Maybe you're just like, man, I'm up into this mountain. I'm face to face. And it's, and it's not I'm looking at the mountain going, oh, it's like you, are, you feel the mountain is this close. And you go, how can I practically apply this to my life today? Simply 
focus on God. You say, how do I focus on God if the mountain is right here? Worship. And you may be face to face with that mountain, but you're going to worship. You're going to worship. If, if, if I go over here to the wall, can you follow me? Oh, here's a wall right here. I'm going to go to this. I was going to go over there and look at the wall. I can't get all the way up to this one, but I want you to watch this. This right here is not really the way to live life. So some of us, the mountain is this close. The, our perspective is mountain perspective. Your language is mountain language. Your dialect, everything is mountain. It's, it's, it's mountain. And here's the deal. This isn't a, a like, well, I'm just around judge, judging people. People are just so judgy. A lot of times we say that because they see the mountain clearer than we do and we don't like the what they see. Well, they're just judging me. No, maybe they're being a friend and saying, hey, you got a big mountain in your face. Stop it. That's one of the greatest therapy lessons in the entire world. Stop it. But sometimes we can't. Sometimes we don't have the mountain. The mountain has us, and I get it. All of us have been there in some way or another, and it's, it's too big for us, but, but it's not too big for worship. So I want you to see we are face-to-face -face with this, and all we need to do is right there in the midst of this is just begin to worship. And you go, well, that doesn't feel like I'm doing anything. That doesn't feel like God's doing anything. But even when you don't see it, he's working. Even when you don't feel it, he's working. He's moving. Well, I just don't feel God. That's okay. We know that we have the gift of his presence. We know that we can treasure his presence. And all of a sudden, what begins to happen? All of a sudden, what seemed like was such, so, so, such a big obstacle, you take a step back and you just begin to worship. You just begin to, and guess what happens? You just, you back up and you begin to worship and you, you back up. You're getting a better perspective. Ch check this out. <laughs> this is what, what's a paradox of this. It isn't that the mountain changed. Your perspective of the mountain changed and what seemed like so big and such an obstacle that you couldn't find a way around. Can I just tell you, a mile that way still worshiping God, you're not ever gonna be, that mountain has a whole different perspective. And sometimes we're like, why, why in the word does it say things that seem so out of reach? Because the word in the Bible has the 30,000 mile perspective. We're so face to face with the obstacle that we think the word won't work for me. Worship, make a place for the presence of God. Well, that church stuff don't work for me. Just worship. It seems to work for those who believe. Just worship. And I still got halfway through this message, Sam. But we'll be back right here next week. Let's just worship. Oh, God, that you would rend the heavens. God, that you would rend the heavens. God, that you would rend the heavens and come down. Have you been wanting God to do something, but you just rather him do it from a distance? Because it's like when God shows up, he wants to be God. There's no formula for worship. Just set our hearts and our minds on him. Oh God, Lord, all over this room today, we worship you. We honor your presence in this place. God, that you would rend the heavens and come down. Come on, where do you need God to manifest his presence right now? Where do you need to worship God and make him big in your life? What is it that's got your attention? What is it right now that is kind of playing tricks on your mind that's got you talked into thinking your God is smaller than this thing? Lord, today, all over this room and those watching online, we just make the decision to go vertical. Going vertical today. Set our hearts and our focus on you. 
we worship you. <laughs> we worship you on the mountain. We worship you in the valley. We worship you. Come on, you might just want to whisper that to him. Lord, I worship you. I worship you. Turn my heart to you. Set my affection on you. With every head bowed and every eye closed, a life of worship begins with a relationship with Jesus. Jesus is what makes God's presence available. But it begins with an experience called salvation. The Bible says that when we believe in him, we'll live forever, that decision in our hearts. And you go, man, it really seems kind of weird to make a decision now that would affect eternity, but we've got to make it. Every single one of us have to make it. We are lost without him. And Jesus loves you so much that he came and he died on the cross to save you of your sins so that today you would be here in this place to say yes to him. The Bible says that he has already said yes to us. He's thrown the door wide open. But sin keeps us from relationship with him. And I'm going to ask you the most important question you'll ever be asked. Today, do you need a relationship with Jesus? Do you need to surrender your life to him? There is a real hell and a real heaven. And you were never designed, never created to be away from God in a place called hell. He created you to be with him and to know him personally. Maybe you have prayed this prayer before and maybe you're a member of a church. I'm really not asking anything about that, but, but maybe today you just say, I need a fresh start. I need the slate wiped clean and I just need a really fresh start. Michael, I need to just re-engage in this relationship with Jesus. That is just as solemn and important of a prayer and we wanna help you make that fresh start today. We're not gonna embarrass you or call you out or make you say anything, but if that's you, either one of those decisions, today you're ready for a fresh start or you need to begin a relationship with Jesus, make the decision to go to heaven and spend eternity with him. I'm gonna ask you to be bold and just slip your hand up and put it right back down at the count of three, one, two, three. Is that you? Just put your hand up, put it right back down. Pray for me today, I need Jesus. Thank you, I need Jesus, thank you. You can put it up and put it right back down. Thank you, thank you. Come on, just a couple more seconds. Christians praying. Ready to begin a relationship with Jesus. You know, we, we talked about the spirit of adoption, that the Holy Spirit comes inside, and he helps you know you're saved. I struggled as a kid. There was a time period where I really struggled. Was I really saved? Like, I felt like if I messed up that, that maybe God left me and that I didn't feel saved all the time. And, and I would worry and I would be fearful that, that maybe God would come, come and, and leave me or, or that he wasn't there. And, and, and perhaps you're here today and you just say, hey, Michael, I know I'm saved. I've prayed this prayer and, and I believe in Jesus, but there's just something in my heart that I doubt this a lot. I, I get frustrated because I doubt, does, does he really love me? Is he really there? Do, do I really belong to him? And you're just ready to settle that. You would just, you, your prayer today would be, God, would you settle that in my heart so that I never wonder? Would you settle that I'm sure, that I'm sure, that I'm sure that I'm going to heaven? If that's you, just slip your hand up and put it right back down. We're going to believe. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Come on, let's just settle it today. Who is that? Who is that? Somebody else, you want to join these other? I'm not, you're tired of struggling that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. You can put it up. You put your hand up. You can put it right back down. <laughs> Those of you that have just asked for that, you'll notice something. If you just sit there in the stillness, you'll notice the presence of God. That it may be a warmth. It may be kind of like a hug. It may be just this thing of, of peace or what you're sensing right now is him saying, I got you. You're mine. You belong to me. Spirit of adoption. Spirit of adoption. He's a good father. He didn't want to leave you wondering, questioning. For the rest of you, I'm going to give you some words to pray. And you can pray your own prayer in your heart. The Bible says that when you believe, those who believe, and so you've already believed in your heart, I, I just want to give you some words because there is power in confession and you being able to say, God, you're mine and I commit my life to you. And so you can pray this prayer along with me or pray your own prayer that's, that's similar to this uh, in your heart. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for Jesus. Jesus, I believe you're real. I believe you came and you died on the cross to save me of my sin and sickness and selfishness. You, you took care of all of that that kept me from you. Thank you for that. I needed you and you came. And so today I receive you as the Lord of my life. Today I receive a fresh start, a, a clean slate. 
to begin fresh and new. I thank you that when I breathe my last breath here, I'll see you in eternity in a place called heaven that you've made for me. Thank you, Jesus, for that. And then I thank you for a life of worship, a life that's with you in relationship with you. And that, that as I walk out here today, I'm, I'm changed. I'm a brand new creation that I'm in a relationship with Jesus. Thank you for that. Come be my best friend. Come walk with me in this life. Jesus, I love you. Thank you for speaking to me today. Thank you for loving me so much. In your name I pray, amen.